All right. So today we are going to be looking at something. And um, how many of you were blessed by last week's ministration by our dear mother in the house, Pastor Emiso Olabi? That message was for the books. You are asking, what, what message? What message? Go online and go and check it. It's there. Yes. And I'm going to be adding to that message. So I'm going to also be going to John 11. All right. But I'm going to take a different perspective to it. You know, one of the things P.I. taught us yesterday, last week was God used that opportunity to create new memories with his children. You remember, right? That's what she was trying to tell us. That at the best, they saw Jesus as a healer. But God, it was almost like God opened a new portal for himself that I also bring from the dead, which was a fantastic word. So I will be going there, but I'm going to be showing you another perspective concerning that message now was that the first time Jesus was going to bring one somebody back to life Bible scholars was that the first time how many, how many of you know how many times Jesus brought the dead back to life let's see hmm. again, again. well according to the scriptures three times uh -huh. I like my church. When they hear three times, yeah, 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 three. So there are three times. There was one time, and you can find this in Matthew 23, uh, Matthew 9, 23. This was the case of, I think, Jairus' daughter, right? And we remember that it was a two-in-one combo because he was going to bring her back to life, but he now got accosted by the woman with the issue of blood. You remember the story now? And with all the drama that happened there, by the time he went to Jairus' daughter, she had died. And Jesus brought her back to life. Glory to Jesus. Now, the second one was about a widow's son. Now, what was peculiar about this was that Jesus didn't know them. Jesus was just passing by. So, it was not like I said there was something about this widow's child. It was not, it was not a future disciple that Jesus said, ah, this one cannot die. No. It was a random worker. He was going into a city and he heard something. He heard that a woman's only child had died. And right there, the one thing that moved him was compassion. He just said, ah, Kodao, it's not good. Ah, our only child, hey, where is he? And the Bible said that he went there. And he told the boy, boy, get up. And the Bible said the boy got up. And he took the child and he handed him over to the mother. Such a wonderful God. He was just passing by. You know, you think that that type of healing, ah, <laughs> there will be drama. He was just passing by. And he heard. And he did that. Then there's the one of John 11, which is the story of Lazarus, his friend. But you see, across all these three cases of raising from the dead, Lazarus' own was somewhat special. How many of you know? It was special. All <laughs> dead to life is special. But there was something that was, maybe not special, is, maybe special is not the word. There was something that was significant concerning Lazarus' story. But I'm going to start from this twist. I saw something in the scripture that caught my attention. Somebody say, caught my attention. Let's go to John 11 verse 4. Let's see what it says. John 11 verse 4. Somebody there? He says, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. Tell your neighbor, end in death. Look for the second neighbor, tell them, end in death. It means that there are many things it can end in, but it will not be what? Good. Awesome. Now, he says, it happened. Let me use NLT. You guys, you, you, you know my favorite translation. It says, it happened. Tell your neighbor, it happened. His sickness will not end in death. But he saw it happen. But he says, it happened for a reason. Now, what was that reason? You see, all the time, he would just bring from the dead back to life. But with Lazarus, there was a reason. It says, but it happened for the glory of God. So it happened for one, the what? Glory of God, pillar number one. 
Then number two, he said, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So it means that there are certain troubles that can give God glory. Is somebody with me? It means that situations in your life are signs from it hurting you. Inside of it is ability for it to give glory to God. If you understand this message today, you will treat your challenges with a difference. Is somebody with me? So two pillars concerning the sickness of Lazarus is that number one, it happened for the glory of God and that's God the Father. Then he now says, the acts that will happen afterwards will now give glory unto Jesus. Tell your neighbor, that thing that happened can give glory to God and it can glorify Jesus. Look at another neighbor and tell them, that thing that you are not proud of that you feel that it should not have happened. It has happened because it can give and it will give glory to God. To d- Hallelujah. You guys are getting it. But now here now comes they will say I have English the conundrum. The fact that there were three people that the Bible literally said he loved them. Are, are you with me? The first story, he was called by a leader in Jerusalem. Jairus' father was a leader. There was no relationship per se. It was just, ah, my son, my daughter is there, help me. The second one was a stranger. But this one was the one he loved. So you would have thought that if everybody was going to get Jehovah sharp sharp, it would be who? It should be Lazarus. It's the same way you, you come to Hope Nation. You are the best dancer in this place. When you give your dance, eh? Nobody say, are they Chris? Now God, are they? When you start, we know you have started. So you should not be the one that after you have Chris in the dance, you are saying anti-transport. Hi. Supernaturally, heaven should just, we should just be saying naira notes, dollars, pounds. Do you know my daughter is dancing? Eh? There are certain things that happen to us as Christians that we are like, it should not be me, Jesus. <laughs> not be me. I should not be the one dealing with this. We don't pass on. But by my sacrifice, the things I don't do for a yard, ah, ah, Baba, think calm. The Bible said that for these three people, he not only had history, he had emotions. And it was emotions of love. You know that this same Mary and Martha was the same one that he went to their house. And Mary was seated. Martha was everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he still said, Auntie, calm down. So there was history. So they called him that Jesus, your friend. You know that's how the Bible said it. He said, your friend is sick. Verse 5 says, I like the translation of the NLT. It says, So, although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Is that, are there people that you literally feel that with all your cry, Jesus stood where he was? Not moving concerning that issue. Can we say the truth? It happens. Well, if you don't believe me because you're too Christianese, it happened to Daddy Lazi, uh, Uncle Lassisi, it happened to him. He should not be the one that Jesus will tarry two days. Do you understand me? We share too much, God. God in my prayer life. It should not be me. But what if it's you? So I started to think about it. And I started to look at it again that was it something about God's inability to do it then? But I also understand that there are many cases in the Bible that Jesus has applied speed to save people from death. Case in point, Peter. The Bible says that Peter experimented a work of faith. He says, Jesus, if it is you, bid me to what? Come. And Jesus said, be our neighbor. Isn't it? Uh-huh. 
And as he went, he really saw that he did walk, like brother said. But in all the confusion of the looking around, the Bible said he started to sink. Now, here is what I know about water. When the Bible said he started to sink, it was not quicksand. You know, quicksand is the one that you go gradually. You see, when you lose faith in water, you do. Tum. Am, I, am I speaking or am I speaking? So it was not a case of, he they go slowly, Jesus, oh, no. It was a case of, tum. and between the time that he lost faith and he was about to go down under, the distance that Jesus was, because the Bible said that at the first time they did not see him, it was a silhouette they saw, it was far away, so it was far away that it was only a silhouette they could see, and the silhouette looked like a ghost, he now had to speak, to say, calm down guys, it is me, oh it's Jesus, bid me to come, so Jesus was still far away, how was it that between the twinkle of a second, Jesus was there to quickly hold him by the hand, and keep him from drowning? So the problem is not that God doesn't have speed. But if you wait two days on your matter, can I tell you, there is a glory at stake. So today I want to show you the glory of the Lord. Because he said, for this sickness, it will show my glory. So I started to research, what is Jesus talking about concerning glory? What is the big deal about glory? Guess what, guys? I found out that the way Jesus was speaking about glory was the same word he was using for his death. Hold on. We are talking about the death of Lazarus, and you say you want to take glory here. Then even you too, you talk about your own death as glory. Let me show you. Open your Bibles to John 12. Hold on, let me, let me just find it here. Open your Bibles to John 12 verse 23. John 12 verse 23 says, And Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to what? No, come on, help me. I need, I need participation today. Now the time has come for the Son of Man to do what? Do you know what he was talking about? Do you know that entering of glory that he's talking about? He's talking about his death. See the way Jesus is seeing death. He's seeing it as a glory maker. He said, now the time has come for me to enter my glory. Okay. So when Jesus said, and I want you to pay attention, when Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God, the, you will find out that why the death to life situation of Lazarus was important or significant was because it was a foretaste of his own death. Are you listening to me? There was something about what the death of Lazarus would do that will also re-echo what his own death will do. You see, the reason why Jesus will allow his loved one to stay two days in death is because there is a glory that he wants to use that life to do. So if you are here and you are currently experiencing any form of time lag, just before you curse God, God you want to please check, God, are you about to fire me, Dabira? Because it's the song you sing but this is the way it looks. So Jesus starts to tell us that concerning his own death, it is glory. I want to help somebody. Somebody will say, Pio, I get it, but how do I manage a season where I actually feel bad that there is a delay or there is a death and I am currently waiting on God for him to do something? Jesus has shown us right here. Open your Bibles to the same John 12, verse 27. Now, Jesus, 
Guys, if you feel like Jesus walked the surface of the earth without emotions, I, 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 I say it to you that you did not experience or you have not experienced the best of God. Jesus had emotions. Oh, Jesus showed emotions. But Jesus did not let the emotions control him. John 12, John 11 was a very beautiful story that showed Jesus demonstrates two major emotions. That was the first place that the Bible said that Jesus wept. Now he wept because he was pained. It was not because he had too much water in his eyes. Another thing the Bible showed us that he also got angry. So Jesus had emotions. Right? But the difference between Jesus and us is Jesus channels his emotions positively. Are we there? Are we there? So, did you see, the Bible did, never, did not say, don't get angry. It says, in your anger, don't what? Don't sin. Because emotions are important. But like we always say, emotions are beautiful passengers, but they are lousy drivers. Don't let emotions drive you to things that you are not proud of. All right. Just putting that as a side note. Look at John 12, verse 27. Now, the Bible says, and, John, and Jesus said, now my soul is deeply troubled. Is this an emotion or not? Do we not go through this or not? Are there not places or times in your life that your soul, I, I'm, I'm not talking about, I'm saying your soul is deeply troubled. You are watching comedy, but you are crying. Are you, we're not too deformed for this church sometimes. Like, you no know, funny. You are here, God, and grace, they hold you. Because things are not looking like it should. So was Jesus. This, our great God was pre-informed that he was going to die. When he came to the time that the death was coming, even his soul became troubled. So is it your own soul that cannot be troubled? So you should not feel alone. Because some of you have disqualified praying because you feel like I should not be feeling this way. No, ma. You should know what to do when you feel this way. Not try to not feel this way. Because it is human for you to feel like this. So see what Jesus said. He said, now my soul is deeply troubled. See what he said. See, no. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? Is Jesus not relatable? The King of Glory is asking, Should I pray? I mean, I didn't feel like. He said, Should I pray that God, you should take away this thing? Then in his mind, he says, but this is the very reason why I came. Meaning that God, I know, I, I, as much as I want to say, don't do it, I can also sense that you want to use this thing. So can I show you a beautiful prayer point? Jesus said, Father, bring glory to your name. You want to get to a place where you bring that issue before God and say, God, bring glory to your name with this thing. That marital delay. Father, bring glory to your name. You see, the thing about when God takes an issue and makes glory out of it is it spreads like fragrance. Let me explain something to you. The Bible says, except a seed falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. Let me help you understand what it says. It says, if brother is Siri here trusting God for marriage, right? Marriage. If brother is Siri got married at 24, which is a young age to get married, right? Yes. He, he said yes, so he'd he be young. Now, at best, that is great stuff for him. It's just, oh wow, he got married in the time of life. Hey, good. But if Brother Isiri gets married at 34, you see, that marriage dream has fallen to the ground and died between the hours of 24 and 34. But you see, when it rises, it does not just rise in Brother Isiri getting happy. It rises in some other person believing that, you know what, there is a God that can resurrect this type of situation. So what happens is, but that a serious testimony now becomes larger than life such that it brings conviction to the hearts of people. Prior to now, it will just be a clap of him. Oh, a serious got married. Oh, that's a good, good, good. But you now hear, ah, did you hear that a serious got married at 34? Like, really? Wow. Okay, maybe 34 is not wow for a lot of you because you're like, we have passed that age, Bill. Say 54. Yeah. Right? 
Or, you know, like the stories that we hear, a woman of 60 gives birth to four children. Wow! You see, that seed died because it did not come alive when it should. It died, but when it rose, it gathered many people to itself. Are you listening to me? Your testimony, what makes your issue a glory is that when it's bearer, it gathers people to God. It is glory because it diverts attention solely to one person that can resurrect it. Are you listening to me? So, your situation, when you see that it's starting to linger, is only creating opportunity for glory. Are you listening to me? Guys, you know the story. You see, when the Lord, because it's not an if for me and my wife, when the Lord does our children, it's going to be a glory, oh. We feel shut down street, oh. And government no go mind, oh. Because what the Lord has done, no man can do. You see, that seed now has not just become self-sustaining. It has now become a seed that many people can claim. Do you know that the very concept of agriculture is that one seed falls to the ground. But in its resurrection, it comes with a stub of many seeds. Is that not it? How many of you have planted one corn, one whatever of corn, only to expect one whatever of corn? No. It comes with not just one branch. It comes with multiple branches. If you pluck all the one one corns there, one would have given birth to maybe 500,000. Except a seed falls down. You see, some of those your issue, God wants you to bring it so that he can put it in the soil of his creation and that he can make something beautiful out of it. I don't know about you, but I want my life to be that life that when people recount the things that has happened to me, they are not just saying that Olumide was smart. They will say that Olumide had a big God. And for the Lord to Dabira, which is do wonders with your life, certain things must start out looking like they are slow. Are you getting me? Now, these are the things that people don't tell us. So you hasten God when you should be thanking him for what is about to come. The moment a farmer puts a seed in the ground, thanksgiving starts. Because he doesn't think of the loss of the seed. He starts to think of the blessing of the resurrection of that seed. When you are born again and you love Jesus and Jesus loves you, when you have life issues, that is why we tell you, rejoice. I say again, rejoice. Because he's about to do something with it. Now, what was also significant about the death and the resurrection of Lazarus? Another thing that I saw that shared similar issue was Jesus was buried in a tomb. Lazarus was buried in a tomb. Now, if Jesus had healed, now hear me, if Jesus had healed Lazarus before he died, there would be no need to put Lazarus in a tomb. Now, what was Jesus showing them with the tomb? How many days was Lazarus dead? No, it was four days. Four days. So that means he was in the tomb for how many days? Hmm? He was in the tomb for four days. The one that can bring back a dead after four days, do you think it is him that he cannot resurrect after three days? Let me show you guys something that was happening back in the day. If you read chapter 10, Jesus literally just escaped being killed. And I was looking at it and I was like, if I was Jesus, I would consider that that particular chapter 10 was a chapter that I did not really achieve my purpose. Why? The Bible says Jesus was speaking to the Jewish leaders yet again. And he was really trying to convince them that he is the son of God. And they got really angry. That don't say that. Then he now said that you cannot tell me not to say that. You know why? Because you are seeing my healings. You are seeing my miracles. You can receive that. But I'm telling you that this thing is coming because I am the son of God. But you cannot receive that. Then they said to him, we are not crucifying you because you are doing miracles. We are crucifying you because of this thing that you are saying. 
that you and Jesus is one, and you and God is one. And the Bible says, in that midst of that argument, they wanted to catch him. And the Bible says, he found a way and he escaped. So that was, if we were to rate it, Jesus did not win in that battle, right? It didn't seem like he won, right? Because he did not convince them, right? Now, he goes. And what you should know was, if you check your scriptures, there are many times where Jesus will hear that they wanted to kill him and he will actually go in hiding. Let me tell you why. Jesus understood that he needed to preserve the type of death he would die. Any death that Jesus died that was not on the cross is a waste. So he knew he needed to preserve his type of death. So when he sees that it is getting too hot, the Bible says, and he withdrew. There was a time that Passover was supposed to happen. They had planned that they would catch him in Passover. His brothers came and said, Jesus, are you not going for Passover? The brothers were saying, see, we know that you are, you are doing miracles. Go there and show them. Jesus said that my time has not yet come. He was not saying my time of miracle has not yet come. He was saying my time of death has not yet come. So Jesus was guarding very, very carefully how he would die so that nobody would go and kill him before time. You see, when, when Peter did that thing that he did, cutting the ear of that person, that was also another opportunity that Jesus could have died before his time. You see, Jesus putting the ear back was so that there would be no need for somebody to say that there was bloodshed. Because if there was an acclaimed bloodshed there, any Roman soldier could have brought out a sword and killed anybody legally. Jesus would have died by the sword. Did you hear what Jesus said? If you live by the sword, you what? So what did Jesus do? He quickly took the ear. Mm. You cannot have evidence against us. Nobody died. Oh. Nobody's ear is missing. Can you see how Jesus was guarding this glory? And what really is this glory? Your resurrection. All these things was so that me and you can really be able to say that we are children of God and like the choir sang, this legal rights are ours. So Jesus was guarding the death so that he will not die premature and so that you will not live life like a slave. So I found out that one of the things that Lazarus shared was also the tomb. The Bible said that when Jesus got there, he had been stinking for four days. Now, for those that know a bit of science, the process of a body decaying to the point of smell, it means that the organs have failed, they have packed up, maggots have started to eat. Help me, man. It is now looking, it, 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 it cannot form again because the body is already at peace. Are you getting me? The body is already at peace. Blood has stopped flowing since. The organs are starting to decay. That, that's exactly what happens. So it is starting to rot. With that level of decay, it will really be huge for you to bring that. Do you know what it means? You are literally going to change the order of nature to stop it from decaying, one, to regenerate all the cells, to keep everything that maggots has eaten to either get them to vomit what they have eaten or create new structure, bring it whole, put them in the right body set, then now infuse heartbeats that will now pump blood, enough for the brain to come alive again, enough for the man to walk unaided. The Bible did not say that they helped him up. Jesus was outside the tomb and he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And the man came out like he never died. The same thing Jesus is saying about your situation. It may be rotting. I'm saying that it looks like as if it cannot get better. But God is saying, when I choose to resurrect, it was like as if you were never that. So the similarity between the death of Lazarus and Jesus was to show you how Jesus' power to resurrect can actually turn your life around. So when the Bible says things like, when the Lord turned around the captivity of Zion, the best that man can think about is a dream. The only place that you will find out that that thing can exist will be in the dream level. It will be too good to be true. Guys, I've heard stories. I've heard stories of people that their lives before Jesus was a quantum waste. They were walking with full speed to hell. No brakes. But Jesus intercepted. And a turnaround happened. That when people start to tell you the things that they have done with their hands, you say it cannot be used. Stop it. Stop it. No, they whine us because of the transformative power that is in God. 
So I'm saying this to you. If I say that the resurrected king is on your matter, does it not tell you that whatever it is that seems like it's a delay, is it the Lord that saw you get to 40 before you provided a husband that will not also have factored in the fact that you must also have a child? You see, some of you, that is the issue. He can be God that can give you marriage, but you have already started to count your bodily cycle to say even if he brings the husband, I may have to adopt. Who says a thing when the Lord has not decreed it? Because of how limited we are in our mind, we already put boundaries to the things God can do. And God was here to show them, I know you know me as the God that heals. What about I show you the God that was there in creation? I know what, it, I know what a kidney needs to come back alive. I was there when they created it. Me and my daddy, we sat down to look at how it would look. We looked at the decimeter, the perimeter, the angle, the what. We were there. We constructed the kidney. So if we want to reconstruct it again, it will not cost us anything. I am saying to you, no matter how big your mountain is, God looks at it as something that does not move him. It can move you, but not to the one that created the heavens and the earth. Is somebody listening to me? Is somebody listening to me? Lazarus' story was to make us appreciate what our lives can look like in Christ. That for those that love him and are called according to his purpose, he can do all things. Another beautiful thing that Lazarus' story taught me was sometimes we get into seasons in our lives where we literally experience the direct opposite of what Jesus has said. Yes or no? You are head and not tail, but you failed the exam. You really believe that last year was the year. In fact, one boy was dancing around, now that woo, 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 it no happen. There are times in your life that you actually see a direct contrast between what he said and what you're experiencing. Now I bring you back to the scripture. The Bible said that Jesus actually said in John 11 verse 4, he says, Lazarus' sickness is not unto death, but the Lazarus not die. But you see, the power word there was it will not end there. Are you with me? Guess what? Historians say, by the time Jesus was saying this, Lazarus was already dead. Jesus had already known that he had given up the ghost. So we can assume that from that time, plus the two days that he stayed, meaning three days, historians also say that from where Jesus was to where the family of Lazarus and the tomb was, it was actually a day's trip. That was how actually made four days. So Jesus wanted to prove a statement that over the issue of your life, death is not the end. I am. Are you listening to me? That over that issue that you think has been long concluded and done, if I say we have not closed the case, we have not closed the case. And I know there's somebody here, God is still telling you about things that you feel like God is done, there's no place, there's no... God is saying that, I say, it will not end there. So if whatever you are seeing right now still looks opposite to what Jesus has said, can I say something to you? The matter never finish. It's like series. You just watch season one, episode. In episode two, you will see the reason why season one could not be complete. So the joy in your heart, when you mirror the word, and you mirror your life, and you still see that there is still in equilibrium, you rejoice because you know that there is still something he wants to do. And do you know how God confirms that? He still gives you life to continue. Life is not just a privilege. Life is God's commitment that he's not done with you. Did somebody get that? Life is not just a privilege. Life is also Jesus' commitment that he's not what? He's not done with you. So Jesus looked at this situation and you see the way Mary and Martha started to analyze the situation. She said, 
if you had come on time, if you had come on time, and Jesus is asking, who is time? If you had come earlier, and Jesus is asking, who is the beginning and the end? You bound God by something that he cannot be bound by. He can't be bound by time. Time does not exist with God. Are you with me? Anything that is a time problem is not a God problem. It is a you problem. Did you get me? Anything that is a time problem, God, the time of life, the time, I say it is a you problem. It's your fickle imagination. With God, it does not matter. God can turn it around. Do you know that one of the elements of time is the sun and the moon? We measure time by how it goes in its orbit. I say somebody is so powerful that because one man needed to fight a battle, he said, stand, stand still. Just to fight a battle and win. Do you think that that kind of person is bound by that same time? Think about it. Time is your construct. The Bible says, help us to number our days. You are not numbering his days. So that you can apply your heart to wisdom. So anything that you are going through now, that is a time problem, rejoice. Are you with me? Because he can turn it around like as if there was no delay. How do I know? I'll say it. I also was behind time in terms of education. People had entered to school. Everybody was, their lives seemed to have been going to the next level. I was, only the, I was the only one amongst my friends that was still enjoying life of the old level. But when life started to look like as if, when my life started to feel like as if I was delayed, I was blessed and privileged enough in that season of my delay to find Jesus. And what I started to do in that period of my life was to just sit on the on infallible word of God. Then I started to see magic. Tell us the name magic. The jam that I did four times that was the primary disqualifier to why I should get into university was the same jam that the school that was going to admit me told me that they did not need a score. Meaning if I had gotten 1,000 over 100, if I had gotten zero over 100, it was not that same one jam that they seized. But because I had the matric, the jam number, that was the entry requirement for that school. I am talking about creation. It was not done in the history of education that you got into a university without a jam score, only with a jam number. I'm the one, ask me, I'm not telling you the story of Usman Danfodio. Is this man here? Are you listening to me? I'm talking about these elements that you think holds God bound. When God wants to do it, oh my fuck, it will break everything so that you cannot even see the boundaries that were there before. That's what we talk about when he says, he turned around your captivity. Are you listening to me? My wife will tell you, we came from a home where if we had a broken home, we are good. We are just following what we inherited. What we are enjoying does not exist from where we are coming from. But that it did not exist does not mean it did not exist in God. I say your promises are sitting pretty in God. Your marriage is sitting pretty in God. Your children are sitting pretty in God. Your new job is sitting pretty in God. You just need to know what God is saying and stick long enough till it catches up with your reality. Lazarus was dead. Four days thinking. Jesus saw a man that was sleeping that he was only going to raise up from the dead. Look at that. It is for me, it is the way God makes light the things that you come crying about. That is why the Bible says, when even the enemy is doing rubbish, he that seated in heaven is laughing. It takes conviction to laugh. It takes knowledge to laugh. I laugh because I see that they are playing. They play. Devil, they play. He that seated in heaven laughs. He laughs at the foolishness of the devil. 
I can imagine the devil breaking sweat. Um, make sure everybody we will kill him. We will bury him. Ah! Inside Jesus' heart, he was laughing. Oh, my show. If only he knows what I want to use this death to do. But there was a particular day, the Bible says, and Jesus entered into hell. And the, I'm sure maybe devil now, I'm just joking. The devil was sipping maybe Moet and Shandon. I have achieved. And then Jesus comes in in glory and light. Keys. The Bible says, and he collected the keys of death. And because he has that key, if my father has not said it is time, no sickness, no evil, no weapon, no principality, no attack, no one chance, no arm robber, no serial killer can take your life. He got there and he said, bring the keys. He didn't negotiate. He demanded it. What be that woman give me? That's your God. So when we come and we say thank you for fighting our battle, start to have a mental think. I'm talking about a God that saw one king being faced with three kings and he said, you know what? Let's change the game. Before you will fight and fight and fight. The Bible says that when it was the time of Moses, he needed two people, one Aaron to hold the hand, the other to hold this one. And every time the hand was up, they were winning. Jesus said that God said, let's change the dynamics. Let's do something new. Let's do the thing that does not even make sense in battle. The Bible says that these three kings that were supposed to fight against Jehoshaphat, from nowhere, two did union. And they started to fight one. Hear me. Two alliances started to fight the third alliance. And the two killed the alliance, the, the third one. How was it that in the place of their victory, they became enemies again? How can we... Pastor Marvin, please come. Oh, Pastor Miriam, please come. We ganged up against Pastor Miriam because she's wearing red and the red is looking too hot. Praise God. And we teamed up and we defeated our enemy. How we see that upon the time of our conquest, I look at her, Yusuf. And it was the same time she said, hey, hey Yusuf, I see what you do for that battle. I don't just want to talk. You they try to win me for battle. The Bible said that from nowhere, the two of them that just accomplished victory, they started to fight themselves. Now, here is one thing that I don't understand about this battle. I understand that in every battle, there is a winner and there is a what? Loser. How was it that two people fought each other and there was no winner? The Bible said that they fought each other till both of them were dead. Who shot the last arrow? Who drew the last sword? Who shot the last gun? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? He broke down every single battle strategy to the time where all three of them were laid dead. And the Bible said, Jehoshaphat and his men came. And all they had to do, thank you very much, all they had to do was starting to collect the spoils of war. Another thing that did not make me understand, who goes to battle with, with provision? Who goes to battle with conflicts? Who goes to battle with Indomie? What were they thinking when they were preparing for battle? <laughs> Say they go chop for them. <laughs> the devil is confused. The Bible says it took the children of Israel three days to gather all the spoils of war. What were they gathering? <laughs> I'm telling you, if you connect to the victory of Jesus, if you see what he has written concerning you, you will stop worrying the way you worry concerning that issue. Oh, 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 oh. And you would have thought that, ah, for Jehoshaphat to win that thing, or more, he must have, hey, he must have. The Bible says, Psalms, they were singing praise. They were singing. The same song you, you sang this morning. The same dance you danced this morning. How would you know? Who would ever believe? That what brought about your liberation was this morning praise that you did. Who would have ever thought that what fell your wall of Jericho of how many years was the dance you gave God here from a pure heart? Ha! Ah. The situation can be long gone, but it's in the hands of one that cannot only recreate it, but can do something totally new. I want to believe that. 
Lazarus was not resuscitated. Lazarus was recreated. I don't know much about medicine, but I'm looking at my sister. It's not possible for that species to still walk on a dead. Things have ruptured. Things have spot beyond repair. What in your life has spot beyond repair? Rejoice! What has been eaten up by the locust of time? I heard something. There are things in life that you cannot bring them back to their old state. One of the things is if locust eats a thing, it's done for. Locusts are the type of animals that they go into a farmland, they don't only eat there, they poop there, they make a mess there. So when you have a locust infestation, you are done for. But the Bible says, I will restore, yes, the locust has eaten. Let's see what we are talking about here. It did not say I will give you another land. It says on that same land, I will bring restoration. That's what he said. So what is that battle? What is that mountain? I feel very strongly to speak to the married ones in the house. I don't care what water went under the bridge. I don't care if the bridge has fallen. I say in that place, he can bring new wine. The Bible said, and they went to the prophet, and they say, sir, based on physics, head of Acts, tum, inside water. It can't come outside, but it was borrowed. Prophet said, bring me stick. Science student, help me with this understanding. Because he's not there. He doesn't exist. How does he give wood to reap iron? Did you hear what I said? How does God sow wood to the water and he reaped iron? I said, some of you, what you are sowing is not equal to what you are going to reap. <laughs> you don't understand what I'm saying. What you are giving is like, what you are giving is like wood. But what is coming out is precious stones. You just be there to give what you have. So for some of you, you have nothing but your praise. Give your praise. For some of you, you have nothing but the promises of the Lord that you are reciting. Keep reciting it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. There's another time. Prophets went and they drank water. The Bible said the water was poisonous. And they started to die. And the prophet came. And he said, bring leaf. Abi, a Siri. Was it not leaf? To the water that was um, toxic. He said, bring, it was leaf now. Salt. Salt there, hey. Salt. And he put salt inside poisonous water. And the water became okay. How? Like, Jesus, show walking. Because we are going to sing this song. But I want you to sing it with this understanding. When you start to sing, I say, you know, go know me again. I will not look like what I used to look like. Lazarus' death was a foretaste of what our redemptive ability in Christ looks like. That you that came from a broken, battered life, you have a chance of enjoying the best of God. Praise God. I'll share this story with you and we'll end. A friend said something and I listened to it and when you go to buy a car, you have now give, give me your honest answer you have a Niger use and you have an American use 
Normally, which one costs more? The American used. But does it change even the fact that it's used? But you pay more for it. Why? Because it's America. Because it's white man that use it. Because them know they get accidents. Okay, because there are rules in their country that ensure that a car is safe. FYI, the car you bought is salvage. Oh. The reason why you bought it is because they have abandoned it in their country. Now, the story behind what I just said is you pay more because of the one that has used it. You don't trust your Nigerians. If an Oyembo man tells you that, oh, the mileage is 40,000, it most likely is 40,000. If Niger tells you it's 40,000, he omitted the one before the 40. It's 140,000. Right? If he tells you that the, the custom papers are legit, still go and check it again. So you pay more because of that peace of mind. I thought of something. I said, you see, some of us, our lives, have received so much butter because of who we have put our lives in. A car in the hands of a Nigerian, as they say, with this analogy, I'm not saying it is you're you are, you are the one that said it, can suffer loss. But guess what? If you take that same car and you take it to, let's say it's a Toyota, Toyota, and you take it to Toyota manufacturing, you don't take it to Elisa Day, no. You go to Japan, or it's Japan, no, it's Japanese, and you take the car to Toyota, can they resuscitate that car to the very state at which it was created. Would they have a problem doing it? Would they have issues getting the parts? Would they have shortage with the skilled workers that can recreate it? Would they have a problem with the paint that the car came in? Would they have been so advanced that they do not know how to still bring that one back to life? So is Jesus. You have suffered harm because many people have handled you wrongly. Life has handled you wrongly. Life has done you like Nigeria. All I need you to do is go back to your manufacturer. If your manufacturer looks at you and says, okay, we'll bring it back to life, be rest assured that no matter how tattered you look, no matter how worn out you look, let the engine that you brought into the mechanic shop of the manufacturer, let it not be the engine that should have been in you. He is not bothered. He says, don't worry, we still have the engine. We have all it takes to make you brand new. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? Nothing is irreparable in the hand of the manufacturer. Are you listening to me? There's something that cars, they say vehicle recall. A brand new car comes out, but along the lifespan of that car, it starts to have a factory defect. The company will say every single car that has this serial number, whether or whether it has started to demonstrate issues, bring it back. We will even correct issues that it has not known that it has. So is your Jesus. Some of you here, you have not entered marriage, but certain attitudes that the Lord is talking to you and it's correcting is so that when you enter, you don't even know that you have to go through it. It was what Siri was talking about. It puts you at a pedestal that you, de you never even know that that place was supposed to be a danger point. That is what the resurrecting power of God is. So do you understand now when I say your problem or your issues is a glory maker to God. Because when the Lord now finishes adorning you and they say what the vehicle looked like before manufacturing touch, what it looked like after manufacturing touch, will people's mouth not open? Are, are, are you there? By virtue of me, the fact that I love cars, I've seen certain people modify cars. I've seen somebody bring a Toyota 2010 and do the body to a Toyota 2023. And I'm like, hey! Niger! But guess what? When the manufacturer wants to do it, he does not just, you know, we, when we do it, we do just the body. All those people that ever do it, they'll never touch your wiring. That wiring is for the, is, is for the owners. Because one wiring can mess up that car. So they only do your exterior. 
I'm telling you that the places that you are going to look for help, the best they can do is your exterior. When you come to Jesus, he fixes even to the interior. He fixes even to the one that people will never know was there. He goes deep. He heals deep. Lazarus came out like someone that was never sick, like someone that was never stinking. Can you rise up this morning? If Jesus touches you, your life will look like you were never sick. It will look like you were never stinking. And today, you are going to say, Lord, let me see your glory. I end with this same word that Jesus said to Martha. We're going to pray right now. And we're going to sing about Faye Midabira. The Bible says in John 11 verse 25, it says, And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. But this is where I'm going. John 11 verse 40. Please put it on the screen. John 11 verse 40. And this is a comforting word and assuring word for somebody right now. John 11 verse 40. Now, Jesus is speaking to you that came here to service today. Are you with me? Don't get distracted. You came with questions. I have the answer. What did he say there? And Jesus, what does response mean? You asked a question and he did what? He gave an answer. So you are here and you are saying, God, I need an answer. What is the answer? And Jesus responded, didn't I tell you? You will see God's glory if you believe. Over that issue of your life, do you believe that you can see God's glory? Signify with a show of hands. With all that I've said today, do you believe that there is something that can not only resuscitate, but recreate? Didn't I tell you, said Jesus, if you believe, you will see God's glory. I want you to speak to your God right now. And I want you to bring those issues. You know those issues. Bring those foxes. Bring those things that it seems as though you are starting to live life managing them. Bring those things that it seems as though having given all your money to doctors, like the woman with the issue of blood, you feel like maybe there is nothing that can happen, but today is the 12th year and Jesus is passing by. Who is going to say, I want to touch the hem of your garment? I want to see you, Jesus. He says, if you believe, you will see my glory. Oh, I want to see your face. I want to know your ways. I want to touch your grace. So I can leave your days. I want to see you just the way you are. I want to see you. Talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. Oh, I want to see your face. I want to know your way. I want to touch your grace so I can leave your days. I want to see you. Bring that disease that doctor said is not curable. I want to see you. I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. Talk to Jesus. I want to see you. 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 Come on, let him know. I believe Jesus. I believe that you can heal me. I want to see you. That you can bring dead back to life. Dead opportunities, you can bring them back again. I want to see you.
about these people were people that Jesus loved now Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart today and he's saying I want to love upon you you know the thing about life is that everyone is actually dead if you are not in Christ you are not living and that is why Jesus said to the man let the dead bury the dead because every man that does not know Christ is actually dead so if you are today you are here and you want to experience this Zoe this life of Jesus this life that can topple negativity this life that can bring something beautiful from something dark and ugly this life that can bring light from darkness can you please come to the call today Jesus is calling on you today Jesus says I brought you here for this purpose Jesus says I led you here so that you can hear this message I have been chasing you and today I am speaking to you 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 if you know we want to give your life to Christ with all ears bowed, all eyes closed, please just lift up your hands. Nobody condemns you in this service. Nobody looks at you like you are not worthy in this service. Nobody looks at you like you don't belong in this service. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling you. I see your hand, my sister. You don't need to look back and forth. Everyone has done this at some point. Oh, what a joy. What a joy. I'm still waiting for some people you know you need to give your life tomorrow is not promised today is what is guaranteed if you know you want to give your life let that hand go up let him know that you are tired of your old ways and you want a new life you are tired of the life you are living you are tired of being responsible for your life you want jesus to come and be lord and master lift up your hands don't be shy we are not looking at you for condemnation if anything god wants to celebrate you the angels are preparing to dance on your behalf uh, lift up your hands if you know you are that person now i need you to take a step of faith if you know you are lifting up your hands please come forward please come forward let the devil know that you are broken away from the things that he used to tie you down if you know you need this you know you need this please come forward 
Don't let this thing leave just because you were shy. Don't let this opportunity go just because you felt people were looking. If they can help you, they will give their blood. But they cannot give their blood. There is a blood that is speaking for you. You know you need to make right. Please come. Please come. Please come. Please come. Jesus bids you to come. Help is calling you to come. Health is calling you to come. Wealth is calling you to come. Possibilities is calling you to come. Jesus the bride. Jesus the master. Jesus the husband. He's calling you to come. Oh, what a joy in heaven over you, my sister. You know you are there. You need to come out. Please, please. Don't say you do it after. Nothing is promised but this moment. You if I give God my lifetime, He will take care of me. He can never, never let me. Jesus right there.
in every space that we've taken it because we're unsure you can help in every place that we have second guess your ability to make new we give it again we plunge on this walk of faith again to say lord if you did it for lazarus my case is not up to lazarus at least i'm still breathing so you can do much more with me the bible makes us understand that if in the glory of moses that was fading you did so much how much more this higher glory that we have by the holy ghost father lord today come and show yourself as the doer of signs and wonders in our lives in jesus name lord let there be an avalanche of testimonies on how you not only resuscitated but you recreated for us in the name of jesus thank you heavenly father for your daughter that gave her life to christ we decree that it is sealed in the name of jesus the grace to plunge strong in this work we see it now in the name of jesus every light that has held you bound we tear it down now in the name of jesus and we say that you are a daughter of god and for everyone that also believes in that or trusting god for that i decree that as you've given your life to christ no evil shall befall you no plague comes near your dwelling place in jesus name we pray hallelujah jam your hands together for jesus Jam your hands together for Jesus.